Hello, and welcome to today's webcast, Gold's Time to Shine, sponsored by Spra Asset Management. Today's live webcast has been accepted for one CFP, one SEMA, and one CFA CE credit. For questions on credit, please use the number on your console. A copy of today's presentation, as well as additional documents, can be found in the green folder at the bottom of your screen. We also have a brief survey, which can be accessed from the teal folder. Our speakers will be taking advisor questions. Please type your questions in the box to the right of the slides. We'll get to as many of your questions as possible. If you're interested in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Sprout Asset Management, please click the blue one-on-one -on -one folder at the bottom of your screen and confirm the request. A replay of this webcast will be made available. All registrants will receive replay information by email. Today we are joined by Ed Coyne, Executive Vice President for Sprout Asset Management, and John Hathaway, Senior Portfolio Management at Tocqueville Asset Management. Ed Coyne joined Sprott in January 2016 and has more than 25 years of investment management and sales experience. Previously, Ed was a Principal and Investment Specialist for 18 years at Royce, Royce & Associates, a small cap value manager located in New York City, and the Investment Advisor to the Royce Funds. John Hathaway is a Senior Portfolio manager, manager at Tocqueville Asset Management, LP. Mr. Hathaway joined Tocqueville in 1997, where he is a co-portfolio manager of the Tocqueville Gold Fund, as well as other investment vehicles in the Tocqueville Gold Equity Strategy. He is also the portfolio manager of private funds. With that, I'd like to hand it over to today's first speaker, Ed Coyne, Executive Vice President, National Sales for Spra Asset Management. Ed? Thank you, Natalie. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on the call today. Um, with me today, again, is John Hathaway from Tocqueville, and we're, we're pleased to have him as our special guest to talk about gold and, and more importantly, gold equities and the environment that we, we sit in today. Um, I thought I'd take a few minutes just to go over the overview um, and really talk a little bit about who Sprott is as a firm. Uh, many of you already know us. Uh, I saw a lot of names on the registration um, that we've been working with, so thank you for joining us today. But some of you may be new to, to Sprott. So, you know, for those that aren't that familiar with Sprott, uh, we are a global asset manager with over $7.8 billion in U.S. assets under management. Uh, we specialize in precious metals and real asset strategies and have over a 35-year track record of experience. Uh, Sprott offers a full suite of solutions from physical ownership of gold, silver, platinum, and palladium to active mining equities and debt securities. Um, today, we're going to talk about really two key topics. Topic one is going to be about gold as a core allocation. You know, gold, in our view, is really an evergreen asset in both periods of stress and in periods of prosperity. And through today's webcast, hopefully we'll highlight some of those points. In addition, uh, with my special guest, John Hathaway, we're going to talk about gold equities as a tactical allocation and why gold act. act equities look attractive today. Uh, we feel that gold equities um, are an opportunistic allocation in times of favorable precious metal market conditions, which we also feel we are in today. So with that, I want to go into really what happened last year, because I think the second half of last year caught a few people by surprise. Um, you know, the fourth quarter particularly, we saw a bit of volatility in the market uh, for various reasons, right? Whether it was a uh, trade war or the Fed or the general market, um, the market started to sell off. And the S&P was off over 13% in the fourth quarter, uh, yet gold was up over 7.5%. So you had a 21% spread between the S&P and gold just in the fourth quarter last year. And it was nice to see gold doing as advertised or doing its job, per se, of holding up in periods of, of dislocations or periods of, of recalibration in the market, which one of our uh, portfolio managers, Trey Reich, likes to always say. Um, but that spread, I think, really hits home that gold is an appropriate allocation in a portfolio. And even with the run-up we've seen in 2019, with the S&P being, um, being up over 9% year-to-date, uh, from the high of last year, Gold is still having a performance advantage. Gold's up about 9% since September of last year, and the S&P is still off about 6%. So even with that most recent rally we've seen in the S&P the first six weeks or so, um, gold has done quite nicely. Um, if you look at last year, last year was interesting because uh, last year was the first year since 2011 gold outperformed or, frankly, held up better than the S&P. Gold was off a little over 1.5%. And the S&P was off 
uh, just uh, just over four percent for last year. So, you know, I think it's interesting to note that we're in this moment of time where the market is volatile, and we do see these dislocations in the market. And, and John, this is a good time to maybe turn to you and, and talk about some of those dislocations or some of those periods of crises that we've seen in the past and what gold has done and maybe shed some light on why uh, gold has held up over certain periods of uh, dislocations. Okay, sure. Thanks, Ed. Um, well, as you can see uh, from looking at the uh, uh, slide, gold outperforms equities in, in times of crisis. Uh, it's pretty uh, consistent. There are a couple of exceptions, but if you look at uh, uh, the financial crisis of uh, you know, which span over a year, um, there was a huge difference between how gold did and uh, 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 how uh, the S&P did, um, and even how treasuries did. Uh, in fact, uh, in uh, 08, gold was the only uh, asset to rise in value, um, and that was probably the most stressful uh, period in, in our investing lifetimes. Uh, and so I think that's the best example. But as you look at these others, um, uh, and they may not be as dramatic, uh, but it's consistently the case that when um, uh, uh, concerns uh, about financial risk creep into the markets, and they can do with, and they do it by definition without warning. Um, Investment capital flows into gold, um, and this is a, this is kind of a short-term uh, tactical uh, trading kind of thing. But it's uh, it I, I like to say that um, you never know when these things are going to take place. Investors are almost by definition caught by surprise, and therefore the ability to trade in and out of this space is is only for the sort of rock. Artists, you know, the, the 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 highly um, uh, successful investment people, but for most most investors, I think having a steady allocation makes more sense than trying to catch it every time it has a has a trade. And I think we have, uh, I guess, at this stage, we have some questions. We do. We, we're going to go to our first polling question, and I'm going to turn it back to Natalie to read off the question. Great. Thank you both. The first poll question reads, over the past two decades, how has gold performed relative to the S&P 500 index, U.S. equities? You can choose from the following, outperformed, underperformed, or performed about the same. Again, the question reads, over the past two decades, how has gold performed relative to the S&P 500 index, U.S. equities? Outperformed, underperformed, or performed about the same? And you can click your answer directly on the screen and press submit. And while we're waiting for those, you. sure. Thank you, Natalie. And while, while we're waiting for those, actually, they're coming in already. That was that was faster than I anticipated. Um, it's always nice to kind of get a sense of of how people are thinking about the market. So we have a pretty astute uh, group here, John. We've got 44.7 percent of our listeners um, that believe that gold has outperformed over the last two decades, um, which you know I think is a great sense of kind of who our listeners are and, and how they're educated on the space, but you're correct. I mean, if you look at on page seven, if you look at the performance pattern, I think most investors, particularly investors who um, aren't currently allocating to the space, are surprised by this number, that over the last two decades, gold has handily outperformed uh, not only bonds in the U.S. dollar um, by a large margin, but the S&P 500, and that includes reinvestment of dividends. And I think that's an important point for us to talk about, John, because so many people think about gold purely as a disaster metal or as a dislocation metal only um, or a, a huge drawdown metal where if the market is selling off substantially, you want to own some gold. But what's interesting is through multiple market cycles, gold has delivered positive returns. And, you know, why do you think that is, particularly over the last two decades, why do you think it is that gold has done so well um, in this environment? Even though the fact the last couple of years has been relatively quiet, but over the last two decades, gold's done quite nicely. You know, what do you attribute to that? Uh, yeah, there, there are really uh, two things that come to mind. I think the first one is more important than the second. Uh, in, in 2000, uh, 
when this when this comparison really starts. That was the beginning of radical monetary policy. That was when Greenspan uh, lowered interest rates to unheard of levels. And then um, that led to uh, the housing crisis, which then led to uh, quantitative easing and that sort of thing. Um, so I think that's uh, very important um, because uh, of the concerns that arose from uh, anyone with a long-term point of view about the stability of the value of the U.S. dollar. The second thing is that uh, in, I think it was 03, um, that was the launch of GLD, the first ETF backed by physical gold. And what that did is it made gold more accessible to the average investor. Before that, you basically uh, had to go uh, across the street to a bank buy physical metal, store it in a, uh, in a um, lockbox, and it just wasn't a handy, uh, handily accessed uh, asset. So uh, the launch of GLD made gold, it democratized gold. It made it something that everybody could have exposure to. So those are the two reasons I think that uh, you see this, perhaps to many, surprising outperformance of the metal over the last 20 years. If I could just throw a commercial plug in there for Sprott specifically, as, as many of you on this call know, you know, Sprott has a nice suite of solutions um, similar to GLD, but arguably we think a, a much more direct way to own the physical metal um, and for U.S. investors in a potentially uh, tax advantage way, which we'll talk about towards the end of the call. But I think to John's point, the fact that um, there's been so many other solutions out there the last two decades has really allowed gold to be a much more accessible solution for all investors, not just the large institutional investors. Um, so I think that's worth noting. And, you know, John, let's, let's stay on that topic for a moment about gold um, and really what is the case for higher gold prices? I know we always talk about, you know, maybe one or two points, whether it's the dollar being strong or weak or the direction of interest rates from the Fed or maybe it's a, a geopolitical event. But maybe spend a few minutes with the audience talking about some of the macro and micro uh, views on the market today and, and, and why those are important and why those could potentially move the price of gold even higher. Great. Um, well, the first thing I'd like to say is that, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, gold has been in a corrective mode since 2011. So it's kind of fallen off the radar screen for most investors uh, because it just hasn't performed. There's no other way to, to say it. Um, and what I think is that we are in the early days of a new cycle. And some of these, uh, uh, the reasons are, are numerous, some more important than others. But uh, first of all, we have the specter, very real specter, of slowing economic growth. We, we've seen that China is having a hard time. The numbers out of Germany are, are basically terrible. Uh, in the U.S., we're still doing okay. But uh, the, the forces of uh, recession, I think, are uh, unmistakable. And, and what that leads to is the potential for a big rise in the U.S. deficit. We're now running uh, at around a trillion dollars. We could very easily, with um, uh, any sort of economic slowdown and a decline in tax receipts, uh, see that budget deficit rise to 1.5 trillion, which is an unheard of number. Um, and what's the significance of that? The significance is that what you then have is, is, a, is, a, is a sort of a, uh, I don't want to sound too dramatic, but a, a very negative spiral in the, in the race between debt and economic growth. And so we're the U.S. Uh, debt to GDP ratio is now at, in banana republic territory. It's about 105 percent. It's been holding there for a couple of years. But if, if um, we have a recession or even a big slowdown, which I think is definitely in the cards, uh, you can just look at the headlines, um, that the debt begins to grow faster than GDP. And we could easily get up to, to Venezuela, not Venezuela, but 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 we're getting we'll, we'll get into territory that will alarm uh, foreign potential foreign investors in our um, uh, treasuries, and that could have an adverse impact 
on our credit rating, which in turn would lead to higher interest rates, which would be very disruptive. So uh, I think that's a very important point to think about. Secondly, I think there's a very high chance that central banks, and particularly the Fed, and we've already seen steps in this direction, that they're basically going to chicken out of this uh, posture of uh, a monetary tightening cycle. Uh, gold had a big jump about three weeks ago from the high 1200s into where it is now in the, in the 1300s when um, Powell, Chairman Powell said, well, we're, we may not be uh, 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 as, as intent on reducing the size of the Fed balance sheet. Well, it's still $4 trillion, and they've made very little progress in that direction. Uh, but that was the first sign, and I would say uh, I think it's a good bet that instead of raising interest rates uh, this year, as most economists expect, they'll either not raise them at all or maybe even start to decline if we see a recession. So that, that's very bullish for gold. Uh, we also have, and especially with this rally back near to the, the highs of last September, uh, historically high financial asset valuations, yet earnings are going down. Uh, according to uh, FactSet, S&P earnings will be down year over year in the first quarter. Um, and, you know, central banks uh, – have, have taken note, and you're seeing them buy more gold in the last year than they have since 1970. Um, so that's kind of the macro picture. The, um, uh, the micro side of it, which is, should not be ignored, is that you have a shrinking supply of above-ground gold. Uh, what's happening is that the, the gold in the vaults in London, where most of it is stored, is moving to Asia. And what happens when uh, that you make that sort of uh, exit from uh, Western to Eastern hands is that the, uh, it becomes less, less available to the market because it gets uh, refined into shapes and purities that are preferred in China, India, and other parts of Asia. So the ability to mobilize gold that has, has leaked out of the vaults in London, which are, all, which are becoming – more bare by the day, is that that gold uh, cannot be teased back into the market by higher prices. So that's an important point to, to, to think. The second thing is that uh, mining companies, because of this uh, uh, several-year decline in the gold price, have stopped exploring for new gold. And um, uh, the reserve life of the mining industry is the lowest in 30 years. Um, you don't just turn on a new gold mine by flipping a switch. The, the cycle from the beginning of uh, discovering a new gold mine to actually running through all the permitting um, uh, hurdles that you have to go through, running it by bankers to get financing, uh, and actually building it can be as long as 20 years if it's a significant mine. It's not like an oil well. You just turn the switch and it's back back in business. So we have probably, I think in, in my mind, we have undoubtedly uh, passed peak gold. And I would, I would argue that if the gold price went up by $500 in the next two years, it wouldn't change the picture uh, in terms of supply and demand. So and then you know, lastly, you have uh, Asians. Uh, prosperity in Asia means uh, Asians, growing the Asian middle class, um, how, do they, how do they express their prosperity? Well, a big part of that is owning physical metal. It's in the DNA of, of Asia. So, um, and then just, just quickly on, uh, 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 on just the positioning of gold within the market. Nobody owns it. I can tell you because I've been doing this for 20 years. And I know when we see inflows and when we don't and when we see outflows and basically uh, – uh, all I see is some tire kicking by institutions, you know, maybe we should start looking at it, but uh, very few have acted on it. So the exposure to gold and gold investing strategies, as we're talking about today, is, is, is the lowest I've seen in 20 years. And then you look at valuations of the mining stocks. It's not hard to find really quality uh, mining companies 
that are trading at four and five, maybe six times EBITDA, that's, that's cheap by Warren Buffett standards. Um, and forget about the fact that it's in the mining business. But the stocks in, in a very expensive market are, are dirt cheap. Um, and then finally, um, because of all the things I've said above and, base, and the fact that the big mining companies are running out of reserves, we expect uh, to see a boom in M&A. And uh, what we're doing in our investment strategy is to position our portfolios in the path of that takeover wave. And I guess uh, for that, we should sort of move on to some of these other slides just for the sake of time. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, just before we go into the before we go into the wide gold equity side, which is really part of the, the call to I want to focus on because to John's point, I do think there's a lot of opportunity in that space. And, and at Sprout, we're doing some very unique things, both in our factor-based ETS as well as a, um, a special project that we've just rolled out with, with Tocqueville, um, which we could talk about offline because for qualified investors. And, but um, I think this chart's interesting to point out, John, because this talks about central banks uh, purchases and really what's happened over the last couple of decades and that we've hit this all-time record high. You know, we've already talked about it, but this is really more for, you know, the listener's purpose from just a visual standpoint to get a sense of the extreme we've seen that the quote-unquote sort of smart money is starting to take, you know, meaningful ownership of physical gold in such a, you know, such record levels that I think it's, it's you know, important to pause for a minute and just look at that from a graphic standpoint. But if we could go into um, – if we go into the equity side a bit, you know, we've made the case for gold. And I think a lot of our listeners already have a core position in physical gold, but we always like to talk about gold equities as more of a tactical trade or tactical allocation. And if you could spend a little bit of time on, on why now is the time to think about gold equities and what's going on in that space. Sure. Uh, basically, um, uh, if you think – Directionally, that the gold price is moving higher, which I which I believe, um, and uh, you know, if, if one were to agree with that, there are lots of different ways to position a portfolio. One of which would be uh, the very safe exposure you would get from owning uh, physical metal through something like the Sprott uh, closed end funds. Um, but if you if your uh, mentality is to take advantage of that in a more aggressive way, then gold mining equities uh, would, fill, would fill the bill. And, and what you have is, uh, and, and frankly, I, I've always believed the only reason you would own a gold mining stock is because you thought the price of gold was going to go higher, not necessarily day by day, but over, let's say, an interval of two to five years. If that's the case, uh, basically gold mining stocks are gold on steroids uh, because you have um, a company which might uh, at $1,300 gold, and I'm just making these numbers up, have a pre-tax margin of 10%. If the gold price moves up by 5%, uh, which is nice, the pre-tax margin for the gold mining company moves up by 50%. Uh, just based on that 10% pre-tax. So that's, that's the thesis. The leverage that you get to a directional move in the gold price is amplified by the economics of what goes on in the mining business. And we've already said that uh, because of this uh, five- or six-year decline in the gold price, the gold stocks are, are very, very cheap. Um, but if you look at uh, history, uh, uh, gold stocks in an up cycle outperform uh, the metal by a, by a big factor. And that's probably worth going to the next um, uh, slide, um, which is gold equities um, dislocation from the S&P. And what I see here as, a, as an old hand in the investment business is one chart, which is the gold price, which looks like it's basing, and another chart, which is basically financial assets, that looks kind of toppy. Um, and maybe it stays there, and it may not go down into a bear market, as some people are claiming. But if I'm a value buyer, I'm going to be more attracted to um, the, the, one, the side of this slide, which looks like it's basing, 
and and then you know think think further and say, well, gold mining equities are very undervalued. And you look at the history here, and you see that when uh, you get a, a positive move in the gold price, the gold mining equities uh, 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 way outperform the metal on the upside. And I think that's the basic message, and I think the text kind of covers that. And this brings us to our second and last polling question, and I'll, I'll turn that back over to Natalie. Great. Thank you so much. The next poll question reads, are gold mining equities currently undervalued relative to gold bullion? Yes, no, or they are valued about the same. You can click your answer directly on the screen, yes, no, or they are valued about the same. Again, I want to remind everyone that if you have a question for our speakers today, we will get to as many of your questions as possible. You can submit those in the box to the right of the slides. We also have a one-on-one -on -one meeting request located at the bottom of your screen in the blue folder in case you'd like to have a conversation to further discuss the ideas that will be covered during today's event. I will hand it back to you. Great. Um, wow. This is, uh, I'm even a little surprised by the response here. Um, but gold mining, uh, are gold mining equities currently undervalued relative to gold bullion? Obviously, a resounding uh, yes, 79.8%. Uh, um, so we're on sort of the same page here with, with everyone. I think from a graphical standpoint, um, it's even more pronounced. And, and, John, this is something I think a lot of investors don't fully appreciate is the ratio between physical and the equities. And, and maybe just walk folks through this chart a little bit and, and talk about what's so unique about this chart and why we're seeing this as, as really a value opportunity to think about gold equities um, from a ratio standpoint relative to physical. Okay. Uh, I mean, the first thing uh, that's obvious from looking at this is that, that gold stocks are way out of whack in terms of historical relationships. Uh, mining stocks at one time were the only way for investors to get exposure to the, to the gold price because of what we said earlier. Uh, so if you go back pre-early uh, uh, like 2005 or so, you had to buy something like Homestake or um, uh, the equivalent mining stock, uh, and it was the only game in town. And, and what happened with uh, uh, the launch of GLD and its very great success is that there was now, a, let's say, a higher bar for um, gold mining stocks because uh, investors had another way to express that uh, uh, that portfolio um, strategy. Uh, and I think that's part of the reason that gold stocks uh, fell as much as they have in value relative to the spot gold price. Uh, but there was another thing at work, and that was um, post-2011, when the gold price peaked uh, at over $1,900 uh, in August of 11, which I remember well, uh, the gold companies became very overextended financially. And uh, they um, uh, balance sheets were bloated. There was a lot of M&A that was, I'd say, you know, with 2020 hindsight, ill-advised. Uh, the mining industry uh, uh, got uh, expenses of mining gold rose dramatically. Uh, and margins, even though gold prices were at an all-time high, were very disappointing. So for lots of those reasons, gold mining companies uh, fell into the penalty box. And they've been there for a long time now. And, and what I'd like to point out is that um, under, the, under the surface, there's been a lot of improvement. Balance sheets have been repaired. Costs are under better control. Investors like me, I mean, I'm very vocal. I'm a backseat driver. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we chastise managements when, when they do things that we think are not wise for shareholders. And so that, that dynamic that kind of put gold stocks in the penalty box uh, has changed, but it hasn't been recognized. So uh, what I would say is that, and this will, this will, uh, We'll see this take place because price makes news. Um, as gold stocks rise, people will then look more carefully at what's going on and say, oh, well, the managements are better. 
They're not doing stupid deals. Costs are more under control. And you have all this great macro background. So I think the potential in this chart, you can see that you, you don't need a big, uh, you don't need to get back to historical relationships. You only need to kind of get to the bottom of where that relationship was, let's say, 10 years ago. And you get a huge uh, bang for your buck, uh, you know, maybe four times uh, in terms of valuation improvement. Uh, if 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 people start digging into the what the uh, beneath the surface and see the positive improvement that's taken place, so um, uh, I think that that will take place. I think we need you know a steady improvement in the gold price for and money to come into this space, which it hasn't been doing. But when that happens, I think they're going to see a much prettier picture than uh, what they saw when when gold stocks fell completely out of favor. And let's, let's shift gears a bit. You, we talked earlier about um, the gold supply and that that's continuing to decline. You know, this is one of the cases we've, we've made, obviously, for why both not just the physical but also the equities look really interesting right now. Um, this is an area I find that when, when I talk to a lot of investors and advisors out there and consultants, that this seems to be a bit of a, um, a misunderstood concept about the whole supply of gold. You know, can you highlight a few things about what that really means and help the listeners sort of understand you know, what declining gold supply really is and what that actually means and how that could potentially support the, uh, what we think is the, the upcoming M&A cycle. Great. Um, basically, I mean, this, this, this shows um, uh, a pretty good uh, representation of where global mining production will go over the next seven or eight years. And, I, I, again, I can't emphasize enough that it, even if the gold price went up $500, Tomorrow, it wouldn't change this picture. So what, what's happened? Why, why is that the case? Well, I mentioned earlier that um, the, the cycle to build a new mine, to discover, uh, uh, validate it, uh, permit it, deal with uh, tax codes with the host country, and all of that, the gauntlet of, of, of hurdles that have to be overcome, is easily easily. 10 years and can be 20 years because we're talking about expenditures, capital that needs to be raised in the case of a large new mine in the multiple billions of dollars, uh, even $5 billion for companies whose balance sheets would be stretched to do that. So I would say that that's one of the things that, that locks us into a very positive supply and demand situation. The second thing, and uh, you know we've lived this through this movie now, is that the, 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 the world is shrinking for acceptable host countries to invest in. You look at Russia, we, you know, we would have a very hard time investing in Russia, even though they have a lot of gold. We would have a hard time investing in a lot of uh, Asia, Afghanistan, which has gold. You know, no, no investor is going to touch that, uh, and so forth. Uh, lots of countries in South America. So the world is shrinking uh, for investors like us, and we're, we're investors, our point of view is similar to those of the banks that would finance mines. So the, so the political risk is great, and, and, and the countries that host, that where these mines are located, lots of them in Africa, are less and less friendly to Western capital. So uh, that is why uh, it's so much harder to one, discover, and then build and finance a gold mine. So I, I think that's a very positive thing for supply and demand. Um, and as I said earlier, um, uh, the, um, the reserve life of the industry is getting dangerously low. And these companies know it. And they've been spending the last five years, particularly the large companies, looking in the rearview mirror. And so they haven't done diddly squat about investing in, in new in, in, in exploration. They've cut their exploration staffs. Um, they've cut costs at home office. They've, they're, there's, uh, they, they're, so they're just not well positioned to gear up and do a 180 uh, you know, reverse course about face on the, on the issue of building new mines. 
And so uh, kind of, that kind of leads us into uh, to the next slide, which is that um, the answer to solve their dilemma, I'm talking about the big cap companies, uh, Barrick, uh, Newmont, and so forth, uh, is, to, is to buy new production in the market. And this slide shows that it's cheaper to buy than to make uh, in the market. And there's a huge discount. We figure about 35%, and obviously it's going to vary from one company to another. But what we have today, which is uh, the first time I've seen this, I've been doing this for 20 years, where it makes financial sense accretive to shareholders, both of the buyer and the seller, to buy uh, single asset companies, and you get a value lift, uh, one from the takeover, and then from the, uh, uh, the sort of blending of, of a single asset company into a multi-asset company, which has a higher set of financial metrics than the, than the target company. So uh, it's, it's a unique period, I think, it's certainly for me in, in 20 plus years of doing it, um, and I'm not sure this is an opportunity that will be around for more than a couple of years. Um, but it's, it's here and now, and I think that makes one of the, that, that is really one of the most compelling points I think I can make about why now is a very attractive time to commit capital to this space. You know, John, you hear often um, in the industry, you talk about senior mines and minor companies versus juniors. And in the general equity space, you know, typically senior miners are, would be considered large cap companies, and the juniors in many cases would be smaller and, and, and in most cases considered micro cap companies. Help, help the listeners sort of understand, you know, where do you think the greatest bang for the buck or where the greatest opportunity will be um, going forward? Will it be owning the large miners that are making the acquisitions, or will the smaller or more micro-cap junior miners be the ones that could also be the winners in this uh, potential cycle? Okay, good. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, if, if we're right about the direction of the gold price, you'll do just fine owning something like Newmont uh, or uh, the newly configured Barrick. Um, and some of these similar names, and they'll they'll be just fine. They'll they'll do better than the gold price, but the but the uh, uh, the bigger payoff will come from you go you go down the ladder into the mid cap and small cap space, which is our, which is our strategy. What we're doing with Sprott, and which you have to uh, talk to Ed about. Um, we're we're focusing on. Strictly companies that are, we will not own Barrick, we will not own Numa, we will own names that are uh, trading at five and six times EBITDA that have really good assets that are already producing cash flow. So it's an instant fix for this uh, running into a brick wall problem that the big companies have. And as I say, I don't think it's going to last for more than a couple of years, but it, it, it is here and now, and we, we want to take advantage of it. And John, you know, in, in that to that point, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the physical, how to allocate that again as a as a core allocation. Um, I think you've certainly made the case for why equities, from a tactical standpoint, look attractive right now. Um, you know, we're excited, obviously, to have you um, in partnership with us with the uh, with the um, special situations fund that we've talked about, which. Again, you know, it's, it's only for qualified purchasers, so we would have to have this conversation offline. But, you know, for all you on the, on the call today, I really want you to think about Sprott really as your consultant or your advisor to the gold trade or gold allocation. And we can talk about a little later in the call about our full suite of solutions as ways to allocate to that space. But I think before we, before we go into um, the Q&A session and before I go into sort of Sprott suite of products, if you could sort of close with your outlook for 2019. Now, we're not asking you to protect the future, pull out your crystal ball here and dust it off. But, you know, what are some of the things that are going on in the market today that investors should really sort of think for a moment about and, and maybe pause and say, gee, you know, maybe an allocation of 5% or, you know, into the core allocation of gold and maybe allocate some to the gold equity space makes sense right now, given some of the things that are going on in the broader markets. You know, share with the audience uh, the listeners, you know, sort of your outlook for this year and what an investor should consider. 
Sure. Okay. So uh, this is really uh, a 2019 outlook and really into 2020 when the election cycle takes full steam. Um, we have populism running rampant. Uh, the idea that austerity could creep into our management of our fiscal affairs to me is, is laughable. Uh, given who's, who's going to be running. Um, the pressure will be the heat on Jerome Powell, the Fed chairman, is going to be intense. And so the thought that the, it, it's, it's inconceivable to me that he's going to have any latitude just because of the political set, setting to raise interest rates, um, at least uh, raise the short-term rates, which is really all that the Fed controls. And I also think that uh, if, if there is a slowdown, uh, you're going to see uh, 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 a reduction of interest rates, even from these very low levels, maybe back to zero. Uh, I, could, I could make this argument would take, take more time than I have uh, with, within the next two years. What that should lead to in my opinion is dollar weakness. And, it, and I always like to um, refer to Ray Dalio, who's the, sort of the superstar investor of Bridgewater, who has predicted um, a 20% to 25% dollar devaluation within the next three to five years. I think it's going to happen sooner than that, but that's just my opinion. But it's not just me, a gold guy, saying the dollar is, is, is going to weaken. It's, you know, it's a guy who's legendary, and, and there are others I could cite that have this similar view. Uh, we talked about the debt-to-GDP ratio. It's simple math. You can do it very easily on the back of a napkin. Uh, we're now at 105%, um, and, if, you, and, and that, if, if, if economic growth goes from what people kind of expect, the Larry Kudlow's expect, like 3 or so 4%, down to, say, 2%, and the debt is on automatic pilot uh, because 70% of uh, federal expenditures are entitlement programs. Um, uh, and then, you know, throw in, uh, you know, the election cycle, you know, spending is not going to go down. So, you know, debt might start to grow at 6%. And then, you know, foreign investors have been buying treasuries uh, as a safe haven might start to think, Otherwise, and that's, you're already seeing that in the fact that uh, foreign central banks are buying more and more gold than they ever have for many, many years. Um, and the last thing is that the one risk that nobody that I know, except for a few people that I talk to, thinks is a risk at all is inflation. And I'm going to read you something. This is like reading from, you know, uh, the Bible here, uh, but it's the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it's the, it's the, it's the. You, you can see it e easily. It's prices at Whole Foods climb as suppliers urge increases. Internal communications reviewed by the Wall Street Journal show the natural grocer, the natural grocer raised prices from ten cents to several dollars as suppliers have boosted their prices in the face of growing costs. Uh, and then the next paragraph talks growing signs of inflation. Labor rates, are, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, are at 3.2% compounded. Well, that's great for the workers, but that's a key cost of um, production. And I already referred to the fact that uh, earnings for the S&P will be down in the first quarter. Well, why is that? That's because of these cost pressures that uh, are basically not being priced into the financial markets. Um, so I think that... Uh, what gold would give you is a free call on the possibility that inflation will become problematic. I think that's a very good bet, and you're not taking a big chance because it's not priced into the metal. But the one thing that would get gold really put on some afterburners is, uh, is um, more and more talk and concern about inflation. But you're not paying for that. So that's, to me... Is, is a super attractive, risk, you know, it's an asymmetric risk-reward kind of proposition. You know, John, I saw recently that from 1971 through 2018, gold has had a 5-to-1 ratio to inflation. 
So effectively, if inflation was up 3%, gold would be up 15. And I think to your point, um, you know, there's, there's times where gold can be an inflationary hedge or a deflationary hedge. There's a lot of different mixed signals out there. But if we do find ourselves in an inflationary market, on top of all the other things you highlighted, I think to your point or to your, you know, to your statement, you know, gold could be like good heavy afterburners on, and I think that could be really interesting for the overall gold trade and for the equity uh, allocation. So, before we shift to Q and A, which I'll turn back over to Natalie in a moment, I did want to just highlight briefly, um, you know, a few ways to access both the physical side and the tactical side of the precious metals market um, to speak to really what we talked about today. And for many of you who are already current investors with us, with us, uh, I would say thank you for that. You know, it's, it's wonderful to actually connect with all the investors that currently have allocated capital with us and, and trust uh, their hard-earned capital with our products. And for those that aren't that familiar with Sprott, you know, we do offer this full suite of solutions, uh, both on the physical side and on the, uh, the equity side. But one of the things that's unique about Sprott is we allow you, the investor, to own the physical metal directly through our trust, and whether it's our central fund, uh, CEF, which is a Sprott uh, Physical Gold and Silver Trust, which gives you a co combination of both gold and silver in one securitized vehicle, or our Gold Trust, Silver Trust, or the Platinum Palladium Trust. You know, at Sprott, we offer fully allocated precious metal solutions. Uh, they are redeemable for the metal because you actually own them. Uh, they're trustworthy storage held outside the financial system. Um, and for U.S. investors, they have a potential tax advantage because of the structure of the trust. They get treated as an asset at 15 or 20 percent, depending on the filing status of the investor, versus a collectible tax of 28 percent. So you've got a potential tax advantage there. And they're very easy to buy and sell, and, and they're very liquid investments. So for those that want to allocate to the physical market, we at Sprott have a full suite of solutions to do that. Um, we also have, uh, in addition to some active portfolios, particularly the, the portfolio we're doing along with uh, John Hathaway at Tocqueville, we also have a couple factor-based ETFs. And to go into really you know, what John had mentioned from a buy or build uh, type of approach to the tactical allocation, uh, we offer a senior or large cap mining ETF that looks at very specific factors that we have found to matter over time and produce outperformance over the, the uh, core market, as well as we offer a junior mining ETF that gives you exposure to the smaller or micro-cap uh, mining companies out there. So, you know, in addition to our full active suite of solutions and our institutional solutions and our solutions for qualified purchasers, um, we also have these factor-based ETFs and we have our, uh, our physical trust. So we encourage you to reach out to us um, to talk about our full suite of solutions uh, at Sprott. And with that, I will turn it back over to Natalie to address some of the questions. And, and Natalie, before I, before I do that, um, I just want to say that we've got 38 questions that have come in, and I'm laughing because usually we get about 15 or so. Um, only about five came in at time of registration. So these questions have been coming in live. We're going to do our best to, um, to get to most of them. Those that we don't get to, I will be personally responding to by email. So rest assured, we'll respond to all the questions. But uh, it's been nice to see so much interaction um, on the call. So with that, Natalie, I'll turn it over to you for the first question. Great. Thank you. Thank you both for such an informative presentation. I want to remind everyone that a copy of today's presentation, as well as additional documents, can be found in the green folder at the bottom of your screen. We also have our brief survey located in the teal folder. Our speakers will be taking advisor questions. Please type your question in the box to the right of the slides. We'll get to as many of your questions as possible. In the event your question is not answered on today's webcast, a member of the Sprout Asset Management team will reach out to you directly. We also have a one-on-one -on -one meeting request located in the blue folder, also at the bottom of your screen, in case you'd like to have a conversation to further discuss the ideas that were covered during today's event. With that, let's take our first question. So the first question reads, please explain the tax consequences of owning a gold closed end fund in a gold ETF. Sure. I, I, I sort of already touched on that talking about the products. I mean, the, most gold ETFs out there, because they're not 
um, fully allocated to the precious metal. They're actually creating and destroying shares every day, and that, that's part A of it. So you, the investor, don't actually own the metal. The, uh, the fund actually owns the metal, and you're simply getting exposure to spot price. Um, but because of that, uh, the laws of an ETF is a look through at what the underlying asset is. Um, it gets taxed as a collectible, which is 28% on long-term capital gains. What's unique about our trust, which I mentioned earlier, is that because we're structured as a trust, uh, actually listed as a passive foreign investment company or, or known as a PFIC, um, that pays no income, so there's no negative tax advantage to a, a dual filing. But because of that, um, the IRS looks at our trust as an asset. And so again, um, you not only do you own the metal through our trust instead of simply getting exposure to spot price, but you also have a potential tax advantage on your long-term capital gains and how they're treated. And again, depending on your filing status, you're going to pay 15 or 20 percent uh, on any capital gains you realize, long-term capital gains you realize by holding our trust versus paying a 28 percent long-term capital gains on most other ETFs out there. Great, thank you. The next question reads, can gold advance in the face of a stronger DXY? John, I'll let, I'll let you address that one. Okay, great. Uh, that's a good question because uh, I, I'd say the common perception is that a strong dollar is not good for gold. And frankly, I'd say in terms of headlines, that's kind of how it's worked for the last few years. But I would say look at the gold price um, over the last, 20 years. I mean, it's expressed in U.S. dollars. It's up. It's up fourfold, fivefold. Uh, uh, so that's in U.S. dollars. So by definition, gold has outlived and outdone a strong dollar, which uh, is a, sort of an episodic um, uh, feature of markets. But it's a short-term consideration, um, and. Uh, so that would be one way to answer the question. The other way is that a strong dollar, if it got much stronger than where it is now, and I'm looking at DXY, which is mainly a euro uh, uh, dollar pair trade. There's some yen in there too. And if the dollar got much stronger, we wouldn't have any manufacturing in the U.S. Basically, uh, it would be, and you've heard our populist president complain, and even his secretary of treasury say the dollar is too strong. So a strong dollar, uh, while it sounds great to talk about, is, is, is something that uh, would be politically unwanted. And, and then lastly, uh, I think that uh, we're set up for a weaker dollar, reasons already given. So um, I, don't, I, don't, I understand the argument, uh, uh, but I don't agree that it has a long-term influence on the direction of gold. Thanks, John. The next question reads, what are your thoughts on gold royalty companies relative to investing in gold miners? Great. Um, royalty, the royalty model is a fabulous business model because it's not capital intensive. Uh, it's not labor intensive. Uh, Royal Gold, for example, um, I think has 12 employees and an $8 billion market cap. What they do, they're basically merchant bankers to the gold mining industry. And what they do is they either collect a royalty or a streaming deal by advancing capital uh, to uh, a company that's trying to build a mine. So they represent a source of capital to mining companies, which then deploy the capital to build a mine. And uh, uh, it, is a, it, is a, it is kind of a conservative way to get exposure to gold mining, and we have uh, at Tocqueville exposure to all the major royalty names. I, I love the business model, um, and they're very, very, uh, you know, you name any one of the three or four companies, and they're all smart, smart guys. So we like it, but the, the, that's the good, that's the positive. The, the negative is that they are, they have high valuations, um, and and so if you get if this directional um, uh, thesis is correct on where the gold price is headed. Like the large cap mining companies, they will do well, but they will not do as well as what we've talked about for the mid cap and smaller cap companies. Great. The next question reads, 
What makes you confident that any CEO has learned a lesson? Aren't they back to big M&P or M&A, excuse me? First of all, the guys that were, uh, and I, I, I know these people personally, and I see them a couple times a year, speak to them on the phone in between. The same guys that are there today are, were not there in 2012. The guys that, that did all the dumb stuff are gone. Uh, there are very few holdovers from those days. And, you know, there's a new religion, and the religion is what I talked about, which is financially conservative balance sheet policies, uh, timid um, approaches towards new mind building, um, and, 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 and absolute um, uh, complete restraint about M&A. And, and, but what I do, th I, mean, I think they're going to be forced into it because I think the, as the gold price goes higher and they start seeing, and they already know this, that their reserves lives are shrinking. They're going to do M&A, but, but as I said throughout my comments, the M&A that is a, po is, is, is a possibility today because of the low valuations and the spread between valuations between smaller and larger companies can be financially accretive right away to the buyer. So everybody wins in this scenario for the next couple of years. And when should the gold price approach all-time highs of 1900, then maybe we'll start to see stupid deals. But by then, people with exposure to this particular strategy will be very, very happy that they have done so. Great, thank you. The next question reads, so much seems predicted now on the dollar's direction, and the debate continues to rage. Do you envision the Fed taking action to bring the dollar down if other countries' issues and or central banks cause further risk to their currencies? Um, well, I think it's kind of out of their hands. I think that, you know, the, the Fed is going to have to, um, I think is going to be forced to uh, abandon any pretense of monetary tightening. And they may even have to start to be aggressive about uh, relaxation. And as I say, I, I don't have time, but I think we could be back to zero interest rates within two years. Um, so that's, that's uh, my expectation. Um, you know, the bigger picture is that you have sovereign credit risks th throughout the world. Um, but the U.S. is very high on that list because, of, and the fact that it's a reserve currency, which is not the case for, let's say, um, many other countries, and, you know, Singapore would be an example of a, you know, of a, of a, of a solid uh, fiscal position uh, or, or stance. Um, but the dollar is the reserve currency for the world. And uh, the consequences of weakening um, would be enormous compared to what it would be for a country that was not. And, and so the fact that we, we have this debt-to-GDP ratio, which is, which is right up there. We're in the top 10, I think, maybe you know, at least top 15 in terms of that metric, tells me that we are in a very precarious uh, place with respect to the dollar maintaining its shelf space as the world's reserve currency. So I probably didn't get that exactly right in terms of responding to the question, but that's my view, and, and I think that that's very important um, in terms of thinking about exposure to gold. And Natalie, I think we're coming up on uh, an hour now. I know we need to be at least on 50 minutes. Um, I just think in the interest of everyone's time, Maybe we, we answer uh, one more question, and I've, I'm trying to go through and, and sort all these out. There's a lot of questions that have come in, but um, one of the questions that's come up, a, a couple, worded a couple different ways, is really the longer-term returns on uh, gold relative to the S&P. You know, I, I saw one talking about the last 10 years. Clearly, the last 10 years, the S&P um, has handily outperformed gold, largely because of a lot of the quantitative easing and so forth. Um, but what about... Uh, John, over the last, say, 20, 30, or we talked about 20, but the last 30 or even 40 years, you know, yes, gold has protected assets on the downside, but the question seems to come in on, you know, am I exposing myself, effectively, am I exposing myself to opportunity cost um, by investing in gold instead of other things? You know, what has gold 
done over the longer market cycle, both on protecting assets on the downside, but what about on a return pattern standpoint, what has gold done? Okay, um, right. Let's go back to the, uh, the moment that gold started trading freely, which was uh, when Nixon closed the gold window. So gold was $35, roughly. Uh, today it's $1,300. If you do the math, uh, that works out to about 7.8% or so over those years. If you do the math on the S&P, it's about 7, I think, what, 7.4%. Mm-hmm. So gold has held its own. There have been times when it's done way better, and there have been times when it's done, like in the last five years, a lot less. But the, the way I like to think about it is if you're, if you're managing money for a wealthy family that thinks in terms of generations, and they're mainly interested in capital preservation, um, why wouldn't gold be an important component in terms of risk mitigation, and and the the, the argument that there's opportunity cost, if you look at over market cycles, is is, is fallacious. Um, so um, uh, gold holds its own uh, over many many years. Uh, it's a proven uh, risk diversifier, risk mitigator, and um, when you think about all that, it is. Uh, hard for me to understand why, and I'm thinking, taking the, the point of view of a, of a family, wealthy family that needs to hand wealth down to future generations, why wouldn't there be some component of gold strategy, particularly physical metal, when we're thinking in these terms, in that mix? And, and, but the fact of the matter is that there isn't. And so I think that, again, speaks to me about opportunity. And I think with that, we'll, we'll simply close with one slide that, I, that surprisingly, I'm surprised we didn't get a single question about what percent of a portfolio. I think we talked a lot about it, you know, the 5% kind of solution. But no one actually came in with a question about um, what's the optimal allocation uh, in a portfolio. So I had this slide prepared because usually I do get this question every time we, we present um, or do a webcast. And I just thought it would be good to leave uh, the audience with this final slide, which just looks at – the weighting you need to have or need to think about having in gold relative to uh, you know, cash and, and foreign bonds and U.S. bonds and stocks and, and REITs and commodities and so forth. And you find a really the answer really comes by, uh, by way of looking at your allocation, right? So the more you have in equity, clearly the, the, the larger allocation you'd want to have to gold. But that 2 to 9% window um, seems to be appropriate over multiple market cycles. And so I always like to say that that 5% allocation – really is your core allocation. You need to manage that allocation over time. And when there's opportune times like we're seeing today in the market on talking points that John had mentioned, that adding to that core allocation along with some gold equities um, can be appropriate and can be beneficial. And I think we're in that time right now. So we, uh, we appreciate everyone's time and attention today on the call. Um, I will be spending the next couple of days getting back to every question that we received today. Some are very technical, specific questions, which I will certainly need assistance on. But we will get back to everybody with those questions in a timely manner in the next couple of days. And, and anyone that's requested meetings, we look forward to meeting with you either by phone or in person in the coming months. So thank you. Natalie, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you both for your time today, and I want to thank everyone who was on the call today. Again, this will be available for replay, and all registrants will receive replay information by email. I want to thank everyone for their time today, and hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you.